This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us, we definitely have the pleasure of having back somebody I wish we could have even more often, and that is my friend, Acharya S., who will be discussing her great new book, Did Moses Exist? The Myth of the Israelite Lawgiver. How are you doing tonight, Acharya? Hey, Miguel. It's always great to be with you. And you know why? Why? Because you actually read my work, and <laughs> okay. you know what is contained in my books, unlike certain very mousy and dishonest detractors who shall remain nameless. <laughs> we know who they are. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> well, like I was telling you, I mean, uh, your work I, is excellent. As I've said, your work freed me many years ago on many levels, mental, spiritual. Uh, your work, yeah, it's great. And, uh, I, you know, at first I thought when you were writing a book, Did Moses Exist? I thought I'd open up the book and it would just be one word, no, and that would be it. <laughs> but what you do is you'd give hundreds of pages of excellent scholarship, and not just about Moses, but uh, the ancient Israel, mythology, what was going around the uh, the land. It was, it was a great it was a great read, but uh, I guess the question is, why did you decide to do a book on Moses? Well, I got it started on this thread because I was doing the revision, the second edition of the Christ Conspiracy, which is going to just knock everybody's socks off. Much of it is done, but I got interrupted with this because as I was going along and re refreshing myself in some of the parts of the Christ Conspiracy, I came across this Moses information, and I was thinking, well, you know, I could write a quick book about this. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> uh, just putting together the information I already have in my books and uh, and making it a short, another mm -hmm. famous last mm -hmm. word, a, yeah, a yeah. short book. Like, <laughs> you know, and I did it because that's exactly how all these other books started. Christ Conspiracy itself it was going to be a 50-page book, and it was 450 pages. And of course, now, Did Moses Exist is about almost 600 pages. And, and that I had to keep squashing it down and cutting stuff out and there's things that, you know, it was just mind-boggling. But that's what happened. I started posting around that I was going to write this book and I had certain elements addressed and already in my mind. But people on my forum, for example, kept coming in with questions and raising up issues and bringing in other sources and things that were popular and I had to keep addressing those and those. They just kept ballooning because there was so much literature on the subject. And it goes back, you know, hundreds to a couple thousand years. Surprisingly, most people wouldn't have any idea of this fact, but because the dating for Moses' supposed existence is the 13th century. That's the most popular uh, thesis, but the, it, there's so many different dates that it's uh, that's the first indication that we're not talking about history here. Since there is no historical record of this individual whatsoever, anywhere, current, you know, contemporaneous with his supposed time, uh, the speculation has been all over the place. It goes from the 16th to the 11th centuries. Any time during that period, he, he could have existed. And so, of course, when I started looking into this, the question never was, I'd, I'd known that this was a, a mythical figure. I'd known this. I said this back in, in when I wrote Christ Conspiracy. Uh, but then I kept coming across other people. I'd seen comments by other people about what, is, what essentially is Moses' mythicism. Okay? And... People seem to have no problem with that. The scholars, they were all, hey, Moses is a mythical figure. There's no evidence <laughs> for his existence. I'm saying, well, if you just change out his name to Jesus, then people will fly into a rage and you know, have ap ap apoplectic fits. <laughs> Write books <laughs> and, about it. <laughs> oh, they go crazy. Their faces turn red. You know, they look like they're going to burst, like a blowfish or something. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. And yet, I found several comments by different scholars in different disciplines who had no problem saying that Moses was a mythical figure. For example, of course, there would be Egyptologists who have scoured the Egyptian records and found nothing 
even closely related, there's the whole Hyksos thing, and that was hard. That was a hard part of the book because to try to disentangle all those different lines of thought and trace about it, it was very complicated. So I think I did a really good job bringing in as much information as possible. That's what it takes. If you're going to study something, you have to scrutinize it in great detail, every aspect of it that you can find. That's what study is. You don't hit upon a convenient theory and then stop there if you're going to be considered an expert. That doesn't happen because the real life is deeper than that. And, and what I think I've succeeded in doing with this book is showing the reality of the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean in particular, because we're talking about the Levant, which is uh, Israel, Syria, the Phoenician coastline where the Philistines lived, Egypt, then down below that. So the Eastern Mediterranean area, <clears throat> up into Greece, Macedonia, Turkey, that's the whole area that I'm talking about largely throughout the book. And I think I fleshed that out, that history and the milieu and the feel of the time very well. In fact, this, this may be the most satisfying account you can come across. It's some lengthy chapters about who were the Israelites, where did they come from, how did they arise, when did they arise, what differentiated them from their neighboring tribal peoples, uh, the influences on them, uh, whether or not, what, how this Hyksos expulsion weaves into this, uh, the forebears of what became the Israelites, where did they come from. It was very complicated. It was really complex. Uh, I had to dig into the archaeology, of course, as much as I could, what we know from archaeological record. And there is, what we know from the ar archaeological record is nothing as far as... <laughs> <laughs> Moses' existence and the sojourn in the desert, the 40-year sojourn in the desert of up to 3 million or possibly even more human beings, not to mention hundreds of thousands of pack animals or animals, sheep and cows, and then uh, all the rest that they claim happened during that period, and there's never been found. The desert's been combed. This is not a big desert. 130 miles, kind of as a crow flies, uh, you know, if you were to go straight through it, they get sidetracked for 40 years. And this says that the people had been crossing for tens of thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, I love it, yeah, because you actually show the mathematics of how much these people would have consumed on a yearly basis <laughs> or whatever. And, and you, you give great evidence in your book and your, you know, 10 pages of scholarship and then then sort of a chariot comes out and says, why would the uh -huh. creator of the universe, why didn't he just transport him here? Why is the creator who did the Milky Way interested in women's menstrual cycles? You know, <laughs> your personality <laughs> shines in here and there like, what is going on here? <laughs> I do lay into, first I present the science and then I'll, I'll say something like, uh, well, they, they have the God of the cosmos, you know, now, which we know is just absolutely beyond scale. We, we can't even perceive of how infinite the cosmos truly is. Uh, there's tri six trillion mile high clouds of gas to give birth to stars, okay? And something created that that being supposedly comes to Earth and appears in a tent <laughs> in the desert. <laughs> To give complicated and absurd, absurdly detailed, ludicrous instructions, largely revolving around how to sacrifice to him. <laughs> and so yeah, not only real. do they have in the desert, and this tent is tiny, you know, his tent's ridiculously small. Uh, and so God is so fascinated with this particular man, Moses. And just a few other people, because he doesn't really communicate with anyone else. He communicates with Aaron and Aaron's two sons. But then he kills Aaron's two sons. He's like, eh, <laughs> gosh, get them out of here. And he stabs Moses in the back. He doesn't <laughs> want <him>. <laughs> So this goes on for 40 years, right? They're, like, getting instructions. Uh, and, and it's all about how to burn quails or, or pigeons or things that aren't even in the desert, you know, I mean, just how, how, to, how to make burnt offerings. 
And, and there, like, there's like piles and piles of burnt offerings that are offered like constantly to this god. And of course, how are you coming up with the wood in the desert to burn all these things? And so, <laughs> all, God so, needs a god in the machine to help science. him out with this. <laughs> All that is scrutinized scientifically. And that's just the beginning of the book. That's not where it ends. That's the part that is the did Moses exist question. And then the rest of it is the myth of the Israelite lawgiver. You see? So, and then it's almost half and half. I mean, it's really interesting in that way. It's just kind of like half the book is dealing with the historicity, or rather non-historicity of the Exodus tale. And then the other half of the book is showing what it really means and where it really came from. And, of course, to me, that latter half of the book, that's what most of the people in the skeptical field don't include. They'll rip apart the stories. They'll say this is impossible, it couldn't have happened from a bio- biological perspective, from a physical physics perspective, uh, and so on and so forth. And they'll rip into the science of it. And then they'll stop there because... There seems to be some kind of blockage going on, and this is—it's funny because where the skeptics and the believers meet here is where they—they they refuse to look back before all of this was created and scrutinize the religion and mythology that preceded it. It's as if saying, "Well, if we even dare look at it, that gives it credibility." So we must just ignore all of that and pretend it had nothing to do with this. Some people just sat down and wrote a wacky story. It is. Very true, so very true. I don't stop there. That's my starting point. That's where the good stuff comes in. Yeah, I mean, don't you think so? You, you, read, you read some of this, where it actually comes from. For example, uh, the various elements of the Exodus tale and, how, and like crossing the Red Sea. You know, where did these stories actually come from after you've decided that there must be myths? There's been more scholarship on the on Moses mythicism and finding out where some of these elements come from than there has been on the Jesus myth. It's almost like they're just terrified. We can look at Moses and we won't be so frightened, you know, but we're terrified of the Christian mob attacking us. That's, you know, that's it really comes across like that. So um, by saying, and this is blatant, this Moses mythicism is blatantly on like Wikipedia, I have a quote there, and I use that as a starting point, that is not the proof, that is only the supposition. Saying, you know, Moses is basically considered to be a myth by most competent scholars today. So, you can say that blatantly in public, and you don't expect to be ridden out of town on a rail. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but if you switch out that name Moses with the even more supernatural Jesus... <laughs> then we've got a big problem. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, uh, for the listener who might be interested uh, or is, you know, familiar with your work, it's uh, as you've written over and over again for years uh, on the on the subject of theology. Jesus is obviously a solar uh, logos, a solar god with the 12 followers and the death, the death and rising, the solstice, Virgo, all that. I mean, you've covered that. But they might be thinking, well, Moses doesn't seem like a solar deity. He's just some old guy with a staff, some ancient myth. What do you say to that? I have a really long chapter. In fact, the last chapter before the conclusion is the Mo- Moses as solar hero. And before I get to that point, though, I talk about the great sun gods of the region, and then I talk about uh, particularly the Canaanite solar gods that are so influential on the Old Testament and the early Israelites in particular. Israel means El prevails. El is a Canaanite god, the Canaanite high god, and he's very solar. So I go into all the solar mythology, or as much as I could fit in there. I could have gone on in any direction for another 100 pages. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. You know, once you crack open these, like, the Ugaritic texts from the coast of Phoenicia, Canaanite, these texts are so fascinating. These other ones, Ebla and so forth, but they're very close to when the Israelites started to emerge, like, right before these Ugaritic texts. And so there's just an enormous amount of comparison between those texts and the earliest biblical texts. And there, there aren't as many as you think. The biblical texts, and there's another section of the book that I cover, 
they are much later in classical Hebrew. Hebrew didn't even exist when Moses supposedly lived. That's the, <laughs> the ridiculous thing about it. It didn't exist. It was not a separate language at the time. It didn't have its own alphabet. He could not have written in it. That's so funny. He claimed, they claimed that the Pentateuch was written by him, the first five books of the Old Testament. Right, right. And yet, yet there was no Hebrew script. There was no Hebrew, separate Hebrew language. It was Canaanite. It was Semitic. They were using modified hieroglyphs and, and Sumerian script. And the Phoenician script didn't come until later. And then, of course, it didn't become... It was about 1050, maybe, when um, the uh, Hebrew script was started to appear. This, that's Paleo-Hebrew, and that's not what what the... Old Testament is written in. It's written classical Hebrew, which is something like between the 7th and the 4th centuries, and some of the texts are even newer than that, like 2nd century with the book of Daniel. And so what you find is that there's plenty of opportunity when these texts were really written for them to have borrowed from other cultures, including the roots of their own, which would be significantly the Babylonian, the Amoritish peoples who had some of these stories, no doubt, and the Canaanites as well. Well, we know that the Canaanites did. I, I, tra- I spent a lot of time tracing some of these elements. For example, the great battle between the, the solar hero and the sea monster. How many people realize that the pharaoh is called the dragon in the Bible? <laughs> and Phew. Do they realize that? The dragon with the water, and he's drowned, you know, whatever. I mean, it's the whole watery um, river sea dragon battle. is very classic around the Mediterranean, especially in the in the Semitic cultures of the Levant. That so that core battle in Exodus 15, for example, is clearly a mythical motif that was that existed first and was altered to indicate various political concepts. For example, the dislike of the pharaoh and his power so he becomes the bad guy he becomes the sea dragon and then moses takes the role of the great solar storm god who's battling against the sea the dragon the leviathan the tiamat and, and marduk and all this the archetype is there and so after you have all that background and then you start looking at how the text describe Moses, there's no question this is a solar hero. His, he comes down, first of all, he goes up to the mountain to get the law. Well, we already know that from the Babylonian tale of uh, Hammurabi, Babylonian king, that he goes to the mountain to get the law from the sun god, Shamash. And we have the same kind of tale where the hero goes to the mountain to get the law from a solar Yahweh, and I show how solar he is, too. But they've split the roles, of course, in these tales. Um, the great hero is also solar, and he passes up to the mountain. He comes down, his face shines like the sun. He's horned, the rays coming off his head. Moses has to wear a veil because he's so brilliant. And I, I show images. I mean, the book is illustrated, lushly illustrated. <laughs> yes, and the idea of the horns, uh, Paul just said, it's a mistranslation. He didn't have horns or whatever, but it's obvious he had horns. Well, I take the original Hebrew. This book is chock-a-block of the original languages of Hebrew and Greek for the Bible. I use some Latin in there. I've got Eucharitic. I mean, the list of languages is long. I have it written in the front here. I mean, it's Akkadian, uh, Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian. These are things that I I had to work in and that I've included analyses of. And so this is not... I'm, I'm going back to primary sources. There are so many primary sources in this book. The list is long. I have the Bible all throughout it. I read significant portions of the Bible in the original Hebrew and then, of course, the Greek, which is very instrumental in telling you what the Jews of the Hellenistic world were, how they perceived their own mythology, as it, did, as it turns out. And then you take that translation, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and you start looking up some of the words that they use to describe these dramatic tales, these supernatural tales, and you find them in the Greek myths. There's like little <laughs> smoking guns here and there, all over the place. 
like, oh, aha, okay, so the same word, dracon, you know, is used to describe the pharaoh, dragon, that is used to describe the great battles between various Greek heroes. And uh, Greek, of course, the lingua franca of the region before Aramaic supplanted it. But um, so this is the kind of analysis that I do. I'm analyzing the word for horns, cut on. This book is so full of information, it just blows your mind. Sun rays and horns. So classic solar myths with these horns, and I show that too, that Dionysus, who is a solar fertility wine god, himself is depicted with horns uh, because these, again, represent sun rays. They also would convey a sense of the bull and the bull in Taurus, and that plays into this whole tale. The bull was the great powerhouse to the ancient world. They didn't have machinery. They didn't have bulldozers. <laughs> bulldozers. <laughs> uh, that's a funny word. But they had the bull. So the bull was the greatest, the most powerful creature around from most cultures. They didn't have elephants in places we're talking about. And so it was highly revered and considered to be the epitome of masculinity and power. And to putting, putting bullhorns on someone would be an indication of that extreme power. So there's always multiple reasons be- behind these motifs. But denying the motifs is just plain silly. We're not going to deny the motifs like the fanatics do. They, they, don't, they do not know what they are talking about because they don't have any of this background mythology. There's some really excellent scholarship on the comparisons between the Ugaritic texts and the Hebrew. And in many instances, the language, of course, the Canaanite language that these texts are written in, is significantly the same as the Hebrew. Because they come from the same root. Hebrew's gotten a mixture of different elements picked up as these Amoritish people swirled around the Levant. They start off in the same place in the western part of uh, you know, Israel, Syria, Phoenicia, the West Semitic, Northwest Semitic. And then they move into the Babylon region, which is Mesopotamia, and then you know, eventually Arab, Arabic, but this is proto-Arabic. And then they go down again back into the Levant, across the Jordan, and into the hills there. And then they, you know, they hit the Hebrew region, and it starts picking up other elements. So it's pretty much the same language, but it's, it's like different dialects in the United States. We can all understand each other, but there's some funny words. Some people say supper, and other people say dinner. It's that kind of difference. Or differences more broadly between American English and British English and Australian English and South African English. But those are like even more dramatic difference than between Ugaritic and Hebrew. And so reading the Ugaritic texts, you can see exactly where a lot of the stuff comes from. And then the Babylonian contribution is absolutely fascinating. In the later period, the Babylonian priesthood is almost exactly what we find in the Bible as, as the, the Israelite priesthood. And so then you say, well, what does the Babylonian priesthood consist of? I talk about this in the book too. It consists of doing incantations significantly. You know, there's also sacrifice and so forth. There's a lot of details. It's very complicated. It's already been laid out. It's got a structure. And this is where a lot of Israelite ritual comes from, especially in the later centuries, of course, when they, they're in the so-called Babylonian exile. They pick up a tremendous amount of this. And that is when many Bible minimal, minimalists, if you will, I think they're realists, but that they claim that much of the Old Testament was composed at that time, in the 6th century, uh, B.C., of course, B.C. This Babylonian priesthood has, as its central in some uh, periods, it's, it's, a, it's called the Shemashu priesthood, which just happens to be the same root, essentially, as Moses. So we have this Mashu priesthood in Babylon, and it's associated with, significantly, a serpent. There's a whole serpent undertone going on in this, very profound one, in fact, in this entire myth. 
Moses is the great god of the serpent. He, he casts serpents down on, on the I mean, he casts the staff down and it becomes serpents. Uh, and then Aaron, and they have that competition with the priest, Egyptian priest. But Moses raises is already the serpent, everything, yeah. Yeah, he raises the sacred serpent, in, and then there's a, a replica of it, or the serpent that he raised actually is inside the temple in Jerusalem, the Solomon's Temple. It's the central focus. Jesus is compared in the New Testament to this raised serpent. He is the raised serpent, and it's a salvational talisman. And I analyzed that whole element of the Moses story as well in, in great detail using ancient terminology. And I think I've succeeded in making it all available to even the basic lay reader. Would you not agree? Uh, well, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, again, you bring so much to the table and not only just, again, about Moses, but like you said, the entire culture, the history, the mythology, uh, the archaeology, the anthropology. I mean, you really are transported there. And it's uh, as people should know, you're not just trying to dismiss something. You're actually bringing a lot of scholarship and it brings a sense of wonder. We both love myth and it still brings us wonder to this day. So it's a, it's a great book. And for people who might not be who have not read a lot of your articles at Cheria, and they might be shocked at this one because you mentioned Dionysus, and in your book you give a lot of evidence, the parallels between Moses and Dionysus, and people might be going, well, what is she talking about? Why is she comparing Jim Morrison to Charleston Heston? That doesn't make <laughs> sense. So you want to give us a brief explanation why this old guy and the sexy god of wine are one and the same? Yeah, that the whole wine thing. we got the serpent motifs throughout and that's fascinating and there's a whole bunch of deities that that mythical construct is drawing from as archetypes and so then you discover though that there's this whole body of literature from the 16th century onward and not just limited to one person this goes on for centuries and then there's dozens of people involved in this effort somebody had noticed, hey, you know, there's all these parallels between Dionysus and Moses, and how the heck did that happen? So in the early centuries of analysis of this strange parallel, the churchmen were doing this. Of course, they were the literate people, and, and they were all knowledgeable about the primary sources that existed at the time, and there were many. It wasn't just in recent years that a lot of these primary sources have been dug up. There have been, they already knew about Aristotle and Plato and Hesiod and Homer and Plutarch and Pausanias. You know, the list is long. And I draw from all of them, by the way, Cicero. And I read these relevant texts in their original languages, and I include many of them. And where I didn't include them in the book, I have the study guide for Did Moses Exist? And I've got more texts primary sources in that, and that's available too. But it was grueling work to dig up all of those sources. And so these churchmen were saying, well, we're reading Cicero, and we're reading Plutarch, and all these other writers from antiquity, Diodorus, and we're seeing that they're talking about Dionysus fleeing a tyrant into the sea, crossing the ruddy sea, which means Red Sea, into Arabia, across the desert, with, you know, followers, hundreds of thousands or a significant number of followers, and then his tail goes off to conquer India. And that's all intertwined with Osiris as well. But there are parallels after parallel with Moses' life. And so these early churchmen are laying them out. And I traced that too, and I included many of their commentaries. There's probably three dozen people in there over those centuries that I'm citing. And then I've got some of their writings in the study guide as well, which I was going to include as appendices, but it was too big. <laughs> it was a little bit of a thousand pages. Wow. You know? I think it's already intimidating enough. And so, yeah, there was a whole pile of this scholarship on the comparisons between Moses and Dionysus by many, many qualified individuals who had a list of, you know, alphabet soup after their names, uh, uh, doctor this and reverend that. And then as you, it's interesting because at the beginning they're saying, oh, obviously the Greek poets, especially Homer, Hesiod, and Euripides, they all copied the Moses myth, you know, Moses story, not Moses myth, but the story of Moses from the Bible. 
And so it was always the pagans had plagiarized. Oh, of course, of course. From the <laughs> holy text. Uh, but they were acknowledging these parallels. They were not denying it. Yeah, they weren't so ignorant as to deny the parallels, as we see today from certain fanatics in this field. They knew the parallels were real, because unlike these certain fanatics in this field, they studied the ancient primary sources themselves. Those primary sources considered an educated person during these centuries, 15th, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, unless you knew Greek and Latin, in particular, the classical languages, and could read these texts, and Hebrew as well, generally, if you were a churchman, but you had to be able to read these sources. They were so knowledgeable about these sources that they didn't even have to cite them really thoroughly because the people they were writing to or for, their audience, knew the sources too. The li most literate people who were reading each other's works were familiar with these ancient texts. It was part of their basic education. You could not be considered an educated person if you hadn't read Homer in the original Greek or Euripides in the original Greek. Now today, we have a bunch of poseurs, I believe, in this field who do not know this body of literature, and so they cannot recognize parallels and comparisons. And their denials of these parallels reflect their own ignorance and reflect that that they have not even read the, what the, these churchmen had written, regardless of their perspective. Their conclusions, of course, with the churchmen, because this is their vocation, the clergy who had written about this, was that, you know, the, of course, the Moses story was true, and some pagan poets, they always call them the Greek poets, <laughs> had latched onto this, the biblical stories and ripped them off, those rotten heathens. And then <laughs> later on, starting, of course, after our great, Age of Enlightenment, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Taylor, all these wonderful thinkers of the 19th century, who are so disparaged, ignorantly. Uh, but anyway, they started saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, the, the, I think the opposite is true. I think these parallels were taken from the Dionysus myth by the Bible writers. And so you have that mythos this work starting to burst onto the scene. And then there was the crashing blowback. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they clamped down the religionists and the Bible thumpers, the bibliolaters. They clamped down and said, Oh, you can't go looking at that. And every filthy name and all, you know, all kinds of personal attacks and people were thrown out of their vocations and some were jailed, like Robert Taylor, in, uh, under blasphemy laws. And, and, you know, Robert Taylor, this is a minister in the 1820s who had written about Jesus mythicism, but he also was on to the Moses myth. The guy was brilliant. Knew multiple languages, had studied all of these writings in their original text, in primary sources, and had been one of the most popular preachers in the Church of England. And was preaching this stuff from his pulpit and having great crowds, drawing crowds. Well, he had to be ravaged and savaged because he was having too much of an impact. So they put him on trial for blasphemy. Twice he was convicted. Uh, and he had to serve three years, I believe, in just the most, you know, I mean, Charles Dickens. It was, it was worse than that. You know? <laughs> the, the jails were abysmal. Uh, dirt holes with steel bars and you were thrown moldy bread. I mean, he really suffered. And, but unrepentant during this time, he managed to write two of his most famous mythicist books. His publisher was smuggling texts in and smuggling his writings out, and it was just absolutely amazing that he could do this. Anyway, his treatment was where a young Charles Darwin happened to <laughs> hear, attend his talk, uh -huh. and then observing, yes, observing Taylor's shabby treatment, apparently Darwin had made comments that he was shaken in his boots to present his own thoughts to the public. So that had a profound effect on Charles Darwin. And in any event, that whole era is when mythicists turned this perspective on his ear that, you know, the, the Greek poets, had, they have verbatim, Sir Walter Raleigh thought that they had taken verbatim from 
that Homer had taken verbatim from the Old Testament. I, I haven't seen a comparison. I really, I could have gotten into that. That would have taken me another two years probably to study what he thought was a verbatim plagiarism from by Homer from the Old Testament. But as it turns out, if you analyze what they're saying, they're absolutely right. There's they're just a, I have like 40 points of of uh, comparison between Moses and Dionysus that are profound, and I have them all carefully cited. The Bible is cited in the book, and then all of the so-called Greek poets who discuss Dionysus are all carefully cited where every motif in common come from, comes from. Everything's cited. A lot of it is the original. I, I include some of the original Greek where you can... I, I do the Greek and the Hebrew. I, I transliterate them so that you can also read along and learn. So it's not just me shoving erudition in your face and saying, oh, you just have to believe me. Which <laughs> <laughs> is so common. <laughs> exactly. You know, contemptuously. <laughs> How dare a woman teach us? How <laughs> dare a woman think? Yeah. The, the reader. Oh, God. You know, I still get that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole yeah. other... Yeah, we've had discussions of the oh, old boys God. club and all oh, that. Oh, God. Ugh. Ugh. They cannot hold a candle to the scholarship. I challenge them. Yeah, even uh, recently uh, you put an article in examiner.com about things, secrets that people don't in the Bible, and uh, you even put, you know, grapes were common back in the Levant back there, or they were accessible to the Jews. So of course, when you have grapes, you're going to have a wine god, a fertility god, not just the desert volcanic god of Yahweh. Oh, absolutely. There's a, another section, it's called the vine and the wine, a whole chapter on the presence of viticulture, which is grape growing, and viniculture, which is wine production, all around the Mediterranean. And of course, it, we have evidence of it from thousands of years ago in the very regions that are relevant to this discussion, where, for example, where Dionysus starts to go in the mist, he comes from Thrace, from the northeast of Turkey and, and into Greece, and then around the Black Sea, which is also in that region. Oh, and the maps in this book. There's a map. Did you see the map that I created at the beginning? Yes. That it's alone, spanning. you know, you, you, don't, you won't find this kind of map anywhere. It's a map that covers almost every major place that I discuss in the text. And it was difficult to, put, to fit all that in there, you know, to be able to read <laughs> it still. So you can go back and forth and really get an, an excellent idea of what I'm talking about, the regions I'm talking about. I mean, this is a great education here. There's, there's one book alone. but uh, So you can trace the spread of viticulture and viticulture, which is great growing and winemaking, and the myths that accompany it. And whether they're called Dionysus or some other name, I go into wine gods. Well, I trace the remotest origins that we have of the name Dionysus, and it possibly is present even in Babylon, and th his cult by that name existed in the 13th century, and so we have solid evidence for the god Dionysus about something like possibly six centuries before we have solid evidence of Moses' supposed existence. Plenty of time in there for Dionysus' myth to be copied by the Bible writers and not the other way around. And even if, you know, that weren't true, the mythology associated, you know, before he was called Dionysus, which is a, is a Greek, you know, it may not be the original, it's not originally Greek, it could be Pelasgian, and then uh, there's a proto-Greek culture, pre-Greek culture, and then even before that, up in Iran, there's wine production. E anywhere there was wine production, there had to be elements of this wine cult with some kind of deity, and there are always females female deities and everything where, you know, the serpent deity was male, there was a female as well, and there's lots of, you know, goddesses, sun goddesses too, so it's not always exclusively male. So when you start studying the wine cult with all of its permutations, and they're not going to be that different from region to region because it's still one plant, it does certain things, it has certain characteristics, it ripens at a certain time, it produces you know, what you want it to produce. This would be grapes and grape juice and then wine and other products like raki. It's a very potent liqueur in Turkey. Then 
knowing how the grapes grow and, and all of this stuff is entwined, so to speak, in the Dionysus myth. It's absolutely fascinating. If people get, get beyond their shallow beliefs that, you know, narrow them into one little tiny place, they're all focused on the, uh, the little strip in the Levant called Israel. And it's, ooh, <laughs> cannot see beyond that. Can't see the, the milieu of the day and the whole Mediterranean region and in the east and the role of the Phoenicians in spreading culture all over the place. When you rip that out of context, you cannot see the forest of the trees. You cannot understand what, you're, what is being taught to you through these texts. And also, there's this unbelievable bigotry involved in taking these writings as a religion. And that is that oh, everything that came before is all pagan and heathen and disgusting and despicable and evil and throw it all away. Don't learn about it. Don't look at it. Don't know about it. Oh, those Greeks. I've actually heard people talking about the classical Greek period and know nothing about it. But because the Bible tells them that only one culture has been worthy in all of history, then therefore everything else is disgusting and gross. Uh, I've heard <laughs> yeah, the signature. No. Oh, my God. Oh, I've I spent much of my life studying in the Greek culture or in Greece, Greek mythology, Greek language. I lived there. I've traveled around the country. I know it really well. And this ridiculous, arrogant derogation uh, based on the conceits presented by the doctrine, the biblical doctrine. It's just ridiculous. It needs to, to go away. So don't even come and pretend that you are not an ignorant person and make comments like that. <laughs> <laughs> you get them all the time. <laughs> so they, oh, it's constant. <laughs> yes. Unbelievable. Let's, let's derogate what we don't know about. I mean, it just never ends. So anyway, if you do jump into the bottomless well of fascinating information about the ancient world, you will discover the most astonishing and amazing archetypal myths about wine and vine that are spread all around. The Phoenicians took these myths as part of their religion. The Greeks took them, of course. The, the temples and theaters to Dionysus were built in many places around the Mediterranean, especially in the east, but also spreading up into Spain. And they would proselytize the religion in the plays. That's what these plays are, like the Bacchae by Euripides. These plays would be put on in these, temp in these theaters. And they were devoted to Dionysus, significantly, many of them. There's one in Athens, for example. I've been there many times. Sat in it. It's fascinating. But the thing is that the priesthoods of the other Greek sects, like Athena or Artemis, Zeus and so forth, the priests and priestesses would sit in these theaters and watch the proselytizing Dionysus place. So they were all literate about each other's. It wasn't, again, this thing, we have the only one, and you know, <laughs> this freaky competition. You know, they would all hang out together and watch these plays that essentially proselytizing. Here, here's the thing about the Bacchae story is that, of course, if you resist Dionysus, you are to be hideously murdered. Moral <laughs> of the story. <laughs> so what you find in cautionary tales, so to speak, is that the king who resists Dionysus and, by extension, his cult of winemaking will be punished severely by the god in some way or another, usually murdered. And so... What that says to me is that there were rulers who were resisting the wine cult coming in and that they were either killed or they mists were woven to tell them, hey, you will be killed. We are going to establish our wine <laughs> cult here. We're going to get your people drunk. And that was one of the objections. We saw the people getting drunk. And there are these cautionary tales, like I said, that where the first person who makes the wine and gets the people drunk is is murdered because they think he's poisoned them. And then somebody says, well, actually, this is kind of pleasant. You know? <laughs> but the, if, you re, if you know that these are myths and you look at these as myths, and say, what are they really representing? It opens up a whole new world to you. And one of, one of the areas is in this whole spread of, of the wine culture. It was extremely wealthy, particularly during the first millennium BC. And we find that there were wealthy Jewish vineyards and vintners and wine producers and distributors 
and these are Jewish patriarchs, and they have Moses, they have Moses, they have mosaics, <laughs> just really the, the same word, mosaic, yeah. mosaic law, and then the mosaics on, interestingly, m- mosaics of Dionysus on the oh. floors of their houses in these later eras. And so they didn't just pick up Dionysus or the wine called this uh, suddenly. It, it, it is there, I trace it significantly to pre-Greek times in the Semitic, Semitic regions. The Greeks were in that area in the 13th century, so this is not like some newfangled thing that was just thrust on them. Yeah, some say uh, the tribe of Dan was basically uh, uh, the Greek culture, the Greek part of the Levant. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point. And there's quite a bit of that intermingling going on that people don't realize. We haven't scratched the surface of the Egyptian influence in this whole thing, but... Since Dionysus is quite central to the story, it's appropriate to give this particular information a significant amount of our time. And I do in the book. It goes on and on and on. And and what I do is I dissect these commonalities. Certain of them I put, I have subsections where I discuss them. It's really quite fascinating to discover what they really mean. And you'll also find in the Dionysus studies the root of much Christianity. And that's a whole other book. That would be my Christ in Greece book. Like I have a Christ in Egypt book, which is not where he was physically there, but that the concepts were there. So the Christ in Greece book would have to do heavily also with with Dionysus. So that's how influential, and it makes sense because you're talking about cultists, wine cults, that is really quite appealing to people on many many levels. (laughs) The first thing is that you know, wine was considered a medicine. It wasn't just intoxicating. It would help you forget bad things. It, if used in moderation, it could help you sleep. We know it actually disrupts sleep, but it was seen as something that could calm your nerve day. But also then the drinking element of it where you're partying. Oh, that's another thing. I traced wine parties to Canaanite tag, and it's clear that from the certain Bible that I also include in this book too, so you can see this, this is not this didn't happen in a vacuum. This is a logical progression that people were living off the earth. They had certain traditions that sustained them and kept them going. Grape growing was certainly one of them. People around the region associated this plant. It was a tree of life, the grapevine. This is why you have Jesus, uh, the Jesse sprout, and Jesus is the um, the Messiah from the branch of Jesse and so forth. This is all basically grapevine language. And then, you know, Jesus is the great manipulator of, of wine. He creates an absurd 150 gallons of wine at the wedding of Cana, which again can be found in ancient mythology. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. They believe that Jesus created 150 gallons of wine for an already half-drunk wedding party, did we? That's why he was the king. <laughs> That's why he was a savior. <laughs> he was good at parties. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all its all about wine. It's his blood. Well, guess what? Wine was the blood of Dionysus. I mean, that, how blatantly obvious can you be? This did not originate with a Jewish man. It is pre-Christian. And in the same way, it's pre-Mosaic. And so what we find is that not an old guy tramping through the desert, we find a solar fertility, that's where the serpent, solar fertility serpent wine god is what Moses. And then there's the whole element of the the lawgiver. So I don't just talk about the Dionysus connection or the serpent OT, something that was mind-blowing. I couldn't stop. It was like, what am I going to find next? (laughs) Absolutely fascinating. And the language analysis ties it all together. You know, I would come across with like one word and I would go, oh my God, that just brings all of these things together. And so I have these kinds of analyses throughout the book. Yeah, I challenge, I'm throwing the gauntlet down here with this book. You critics can provide me with a better one. Go ahead. I will wait until that day before I value your opinion, however. When you produce a better book on the subject, 
I might be interested in your opinion until that time. Yeah, this is definitely, the I would say, the yeah. definitive book on Moses, bar none. It'll be interesting to see people try and fail to challenge it. <laughs> I'm sure they'll come with some sort of polemics behind your back on the Internet and it talks and at other places <laughs> where their followers can gather around and chirp, chirp, chirp <laughs> and all that. The usual. You're, you know, we can write the formula. This is how it's going to go. It's <laughs> I know, they're so pedestrian. Oh, my God. Do something different for a change. You can't keep up with me intellectually. Stop with the stupid personal attacks. And I might add to that that the people who are attacking me the most are the ones who haven't even read my work. The people who have read it tend to be in my corner. The people who have not read it lie about it repeatedly. I mean, the endless amounts of lies, they are not called out. These people need to be called out. The people who are criticizing me the most fearly are extremely dishonest because they have not read my work, they are not experts on it, and they're presenting themselves falsely as experts on something they haven't even studied. Now, that's considered grave unethical behavior in most scholarly and academic realms, but for some reason certain individuals seem to get away with it, skipping along the surface and everyone granting them a pass. Yeah, they won't challenge you to a debate. Oh, no, no. No, no, no. I mean, look. I, I know I know it's a surprise to you, but I'm a female. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a historical. Female, yeah. <laughs> but a female is not allowed to collect a thought intelligently. And a female certainly cannot work in 20 different languages. And a female cannot do all the rest of the things I've done in this book. Therefore, let us just dismiss it. That's, seriously, there's a whole pile of misogyny in this field. Oh, there is. And we've discussed oh, yeah. it, it's and pathetic. we've discussed the, the weirdness and the boys' club and the little boys' club and the, all that stuff. Yeah. But unfortunately, well, uh, that's why we got to keep doing what we're doing and uh, keep going at it. And I am very happy to spread your work and your scholarship, and I hope uh, the rest of the world wisens up and follows suit. Till then, well... We're in our little corners, but I think that's all the time we have a chariot because we could talk about the Moses book and uh, <laughs> the crazy people out there from all camps and ideologies, but uh, we definitely need to do it sometime. Yes, yes. I always appreciate having this, these great discussions with you. I just would like to say one thing. If you listen to the negative, negative Nellies, you will miss out, particularly in this book, this new Moses book. I use state-of-the-art methodology and technology in this book. That's another thing. We now have the capacity to search across millions of texts. So it's about as complete as you'll find. And, you know, to be discouraged, do not be discouraged from reading this because it will blow your mind and give you a whole different perspective on the ancient world. And if this book doesn't make you smarter... I don't know what will. <laughs> so anyway, StellarHousePublishing.com, TruthBeKnown.com, FreeThoughtNation.com. As always, it's a pleasure to uh, to appear on your program, my friend Miguel. Always great to have you on. Well, you have a good night, and we will talk soon. Is Aries, what do you see? She sees on all the planet. She's the moon dancer. She's the enchanter. She's the one who sees dreams. She sees herself. In old Greek plays Buried in the wall A fire flies away A feather's blowing in the wind It doesn't make any sense But she grins How she knows What she knows And she knows Do